Tech for Law. It's a new position. I've been here about two years. And last November, we, the library, started sponsoring and hosting and presenting um, grants related workshops for students because there actually were not on campus. And we're trying to fill this void. So in light of that, we have recorded all of the workshops. And we're recording this one so that you'll be able to access this information or you'll be able to pass it on to one of your colleagues if they weren't able to come today. So I wanted to show you how to get to the library's funding opportunities page. So if you come here to the library's home page, and then you click here, which is the second button on the left, using the libraries. And this gives you all these menu items. You come down to grant resources, and you click there. This is um, the funding opportunities page that um, I helped develop, and my student who's in the back of the room filming, Suchi Yohantula, she's been um, populating this all, this all this past year. So on the left-hand side, if you look at workshops, there's a link here. And these are all the workshops that we've given in the past year. What you can do is um, where we placed the Fulbright US is on other workshops. So at the bottom, US Fulbright, or Fulbright US Student Program. And today's date. And then here, we already have posted the slides that um, uh, John Denny, who's our guest speaker, has posted here. And um, what we will do next week is after she <coughs> processes the video, she will put it up and link it to this site right here. Okay? So you'll be able to come and you'll be able to see the video, and then you can send that link out to other students who weren't able to come. And you might also want to look at some of these other um, workshops. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show you, uh, <coughs> we're gonna be posting some of the past award winner, award winning applications for Fulbright with the permission of the applicants. So I wanted to show you where that's going to be located. Where it says here on the left side, past awards. If you click here, ah, huh, bad request. Wonderful. <laughs> Let's try it again. Hmm. Well, if you click there, there is a list of um, all the grants that have been submitted and the full text of all the grants submitted by the libraries. You'll also find two student proposals at the top and a set of winning student proposals. And then when we process the winning Fulbright applications that John has as an archive um, for the students that give us permission, you'll be able to go there and see those. The full application will be there for you to see. Not with the personal information, but everything else, the, the narrative, et cetera, that you would want to look at, which is the best way of learning how to write a proposal, is to read lots and lots of winning proposals. Um, it's also good to read the ones that don't make it because you can then figure out why didn't this proposal make it. Um, so with that, I'll introduce John Denny, Associate Director of the Honors College here, right? Program. Program, Honors Program. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to just minimize this and be ready to go. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jess. I really appreciate um, the libraries and, and setting up this grant workshop and we're uh, looking forward to a very good partnership and hopefully um, uh, some, some more Fulbright uh, award winners from the University of Florida. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm very encouraged to see you all here. Those of you that follow Fulbright maybe know a little bit about it already know that the competition recently closed this year and will reopen again in May of 2011 uh, for the next competition cycle. So I'm really excited that we have a pretty good crowd here that's thinking about this early on. Last year we had uh, 45 applicants, which was which was really quite good. I'm just very pleased with the number of applicants, and I'm not necessarily looking for more applicants. I'm, I'm just looking for better prepared applicants. And I think uh, that you guys are here, basically a year out, to really think about this. That, that's that's very encouraging for me. And I
and as I was preparing for the presentation today, I was looking through uh, the, uh, the university page on the Fulbright website, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And I noticed that from since 1993, we've had 99 Fulbright award winners from the University of Florida. So you know what that means? Is probably, possibly, in this room is the 100th Fulbright <laughs> for UF. So that is, that is really, that is really fantastic. So I'm glad that you guys are here. So, um, okay, um, this uh, presentation is gonna go over all the, the basics uh, of the Fulbright program, what it is, what it pays for, the basic components uh, of an application, uh, it's just going to give you a real general overview of, of, the, uh, of the process that you're going to embark on uh, over the course of next year. Um, and please, as I'm, as I'm going along, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to uh, throw up with me. All right, so the Fulbright Program is sponsored by the uh, U.S. State Department, and it is the flagship of cultural exchange programs uh, sponsored by the federal government. Um, the general uh, Fulbright program information can be found uh, at that website, and they have recently reorganized it. It's much cleaner, it's much easier to navigate. That gives you a good general overview. And then at the very bottom here, this FulbrightOnline.org really gets into the nitty gritty details. It talks about all the different components of, of, the, uh, of the application and gives you a lot of very detailed information. So Fulbright.state.gov is a good place to get started. And then as you're, as you're getting more familiar with it and want to know the details, the FulbrightOnline.org uh, is, is a very good one. And Fulbright, although they build themselves as the, the, the premier, the flagship of the cultural exchange programs uh, sponsored by the federal government, there are many other uh, international exchange program opportunities, and they can be found at exchanges.state.gov. Okay, so uh, just a very, very brief history lesson here. Uh, Fulbright has been around uh, since uh, 1946, uh, right there at the end uh, of World War II. And uh, Senator J. William Fulbright uh, was the one that uh, proposed uh, this program. And uh, as I'm sure you all know, it is, uh, it's a cultural exchange. It's, the goal is to increase uh, mutual understanding between US citizens and, and folks from uh, other parts of the world. And part of what Fulbright was um, uh, intended to do, how, how, how part of it was originally financed, is some countries that had incurred debts over the course of World War II, part of those debts were forgiven um, through participation in the Fulbright program and funding uh, students' higher education to go abroad. So it's really kind of neat to think about the genesis of, of, of the Fulbright program in that post-war period, and, and it's grown into a major, major program. Um, the Chronicle of uh, Higher Education uh, just a couple weeks ago was reporting that last fiscal year the funding for Fulbright was $253 million. So it's a very well-funded program. It increased in funding under the Bush administration and increased in funding again under the Obama administration. So it looks like it's something that is, uh, it is something that's very important and it appears that it's going to be here to stay, which is great. Okay, so basically there's two main types of grants for the Fulbright program. There's the research, the study grant, and then the English teaching assistantships. Most of you, my guess, is, are going to be going after the research grant. Um, there's about a thousand of these awards that are given uh, each year. They're between eight and 12 months. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part between eight and 12 months. And uh, they will fund independent research uh, abroad. And it's really open to all disciplines, um, including uh, creative and performing arts. Um, we had a very uh, compelling um, uh, applicant this year uh, to Spain uh, uh, doing a photography project. Um, very excited to see how, how that one will, will pan out. But again, the great Fulbright, the thing about Fulbright is it really is open to all disciplines and creativity is, is very much encouraged. Um, the English Teaching Assistantship, uh, this is a program that has grown considerably. Typically, our undergraduates are the ones that go after the ETAs. 
uh, but we have had uh, graduate students apply and be successful in the English teaching assistantships as well. These also are between 8 and 12 months. And as you can see, it's between 20 and 30 hours a week um, teaching English as a foreign language and commenting on American culture. Um, you're assisting a, 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 a instructor uh, in, in the host country. And since you're only going to be working 20 to 30 hours a week, you're also encouraged to have a side project. And the side project really can be anything as long as it is, has an emphasis on community engagement. The uh, example that I often use, uh, we had a student a couple of years ago that applied to the Dominican Republic. He had uh, experience as a little league baseball coach. And baseball is a very, very popular uh, sport in the DR, and so that was his side project. He was going to volunteer as a little league baseball coach. So it really can be anything, any community service or anything that you feel strongly about uh, would, would be a good uh, side project for the English teaching assistantship. Okay, so here's, here's a very rough application timeline. Um, as I mentioned before, the competition always opens on May 1st. And between May and September, you're designing your project, you're, you're seeking your affiliations. I'll talk a little bit about what those are in just a minute. Preparing your application. Um, again, you guys are getting a good jump on this uh, starting uh, in November. It's fantastic. Uh, many of you who are in PhD programs, most of, most of you will be going to collect data for your dissertation. So you probably already have uh, an idea of what your project is, is roughly going to look like. The uh, campus deadline is in September. The tentative date for the campus deadline uh, this year is September 10th. Um, we will finalize the deadline once the competition officially opens in May, but it's going to be, it'll be within a few days of, of September 10th. Um, the IIE, Institute for International Education application deadline, IIE are the, the folks that, that administer the, uh, the Fulbright application process, that's October 18th. And that is the, that's the final deadline when everything has to be completed. The campus deadline is, is the time in which you have to have essentially your first draft of the grant proposal completed. At the time of the campus deadline, we're going to gather uh, all of the information from the applicants and then we are going to put together a, uh, a campus uh, review committee. And our campus review committee is composed of faculty at UF who are all Fulbright scholars themselves. And they will review the application and they will, will call you in for an interview. The interview is about 20 minutes. And in that interview, you will give a basic overview of what you intend to do and then our faculty will have opportunity to essentially critique your application and they'll give you some feedback. And the nice thing about the Fulbright campus review process is it's supportive in nature. At the end of the interview, we're going to give everything back to you and you will have the opportunity to make revisions and then resubmit by that IAE application deadline of October 18th. And this, I think, is as good a time as any to introduce a couple of folks in the back of the room. Dr. Art Sandine uh, is a uh, former student affairs administrator here at UF and now is with the uh, College of Education. And he's been a great help uh, to me in reviewing uh, uh, Fulbright applications. He gives excellent, excellent feedback. And then uh, Dan Rebusen, I hope I pronounced that last name right, Dan, yep. uh, is a Fulbright scholar with the uh, UF Library Program and he serves on our uh, campus review committee as well. So you'll, you'll be seeing those two gentlemen in the future, I hope. Okay, so that's uh, the final deadline, October 18th, all I's are dotted, T's are crossed, that sort of thing. It goes in uh, to the Institute for International Education and then the long wait begins. Um, right now, uh, the national screening committees are going through all of our 45 applications from the past year. And those students will find out at the end of January, it's usually January 31st, they'll find out if they're recommended for a grant or not. If they're recommended, then their name goes onto a short list and the, and the uh, application goes to the host country. And the host country will make their decisions between January and May. And that's when they find out if they'll actually get funding uh, for the Fulbright grant or not. And so most students will find out uh, between March and June. So there's a really long wait period that typically drives students crazy and 
um, it, uh, it, 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 it seems to take forever. But uh, it really depends upon the country. Some countries turn it around fairly quickly. Others, you're waiting until June to find out whether you got funding or not. Yes, sir? Do you guys know like, which countries are like more competitive? Like, which ones have a lot of applications submitted versus I guess ones that you know, would be easier to like, uh, get a grant for? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. And all that information is available on that US that Fulbright dot FulbrightOnline.org website. Okay. You can see from the past grant year how many applications were submitted, how many grants were awarded, and then you can see the numbers uh, of grants available for the for the coming year. Now, it's those numbers are a little bit stale right now. Uh, they haven't been updated quite yet because the competition just ended. But you can get a pretty good pretty good idea. But that's that's a very good thing to uh, to think about. Certainly, you don't want to entirely base your application on, 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 on the odds like that, but, but it can help you to, to make a decision. Okay, and I'll, and I'll, sh I'll show you that uh, website here in just a little bit. So just briefly about eligibility, uh, this program, you do have to be a U.S. citizen. There are other Fulbright programs that are open to non-U.S. citizens, but for the one we're talking about today, you do have to have citizenship. Um, you have to hold at least a bachelor's degree by the start of the grant. So if I have any under, undergraduates in here, that means you're applying in your senior year, you're still enrolled, but all my full ride applicants for next year will either graduate in December or May. So you're applying in your senior year, and then after your senior year is when you would go abroad to do your full ride grant. Um, master students, perfectly fine. PhD students, perfectly fine. You just can't be holding your PhD by the time you apply for a full ride. And once you get that, PhD and get that great first faculty job, then of course there's there's another Fulbright Scholar award that you can apply for as a faculty member. And you can get it both as a graduate student and a faculty member. Um, <clears throat> depending upon the country, uh, you're going to need some proficiency in uh, the written and spoken language of the host country. And there's This varies widely from country to country. If you're applying to Mexico, they're going to expect that you're Approaching fluency in Spanish. If you're applying to Mongolia, you know fluency is not really expected. So if you're if you're applying to a country that has a uh, has a uh, has a language that's not easily accessed in the United States, there's going to be less of an expectation. But the language is very very important, and also it really depends quite a bit on your discipline. You know if you're doing a uh, anthropology project, and you're going to be doing ethnographies and detailed interviews and real qualitative kind of data stuff, that language component is going to be very, very important. If you're doing more of a, oh, I don't know, an economics type of a project where you're going to be looking at data and crunching numbers, the language is always still important, but it might be a little bit less so in that project. So it really depends upon the country, and it really depends upon the type of uh, discipline you're in. Um, I Few years ago, I lived in Egypt and I met a lot of Fulbright scholars there, and quite a few of them I noticed were studying Arabic as their Fulbright project. So, how does that factor in? Do you have to be? Again, it, 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 it depends upon the country, and um, Fulbright also has a uh, critical language enhancement award. So, I don't know if maybe oh, they yeah. were qualified, qualified for that particular program, but I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But the, uh, the Critical Language Enhancement Award is something that is, uh, that is extra that you apply for at the time of your grant. And essentially what it is is you go over early and you focus strictly on the language, usually for about six weeks prior to beginning your grant. So uh, they were on a grant just to learn the language. Pardon me? They were on a, a grant just to learn the language, as far as I understand. Okay. Fulbright has many different programs and many different elements. For, for this one, and please, gentlemen, correct me if, 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 I'm, if I'm wrong here, this one doesn't have one just strictly to learn, to learn the language. It does have that Critical Language Enhancement Award. Um, there are some other programs uh, sponsored by the State Department um, where you can go to learn languages, particularly those that are important for national security purposes. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what they, what grant they might have been on, but there, those sorts of things do exist. Okay. 
All right, so um, general qualifications for the research grant. Um, high level of academic and or personal achievement. You notice there's no GPA requirement up there, and there really isn't a minimum GPA for Fulbright. You really want to be thinking, particularly for undergraduates, 3.7 or higher, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, but naturally, uh, a high GPA um, is going to be a given. Um, a well-developed project, as I mentioned, this is open to both undergraduates, master's degree <coughs> students, and, and doctoral students. Naturally, if you're applying as a PhD student, when they're looking at your application, they're going to be expecting that that's going to have a higher level of sophistication than an undergraduate project. Uh, but regardless, it needs to be well developed, which means you need to be working with your faculty advisors and, and really uh, going over the project and, and, and uh, uh, fine-tuning it as much as possible. Uh, demonstrated leadership ability, um, particularly if you have uh, uh, prior experience in the host country, international experience, um, leadership within student organizations, all those sorts of things can help to uh, specifically demonstrate uh, some of your leadership abilities. We already talked about the language proficiency, and all of the uh, Fulbright um, projects, regardless of whether it's in the hard sciences or social sciences or, or fine arts, they all need to have that focus on community engagement and increasing uh, that cultural exchange and that mutual understanding piece. I've, I've developed a very technical term uh, you know, for this process that the application has to be sufficiently Fulbrighty. Okay? So it really needs to have that cultural exchange uh, component and engagement with the people of those countries. Okay, so the English Teaching Assistantship, we already talked about this a bit. Um, new countries are being added all the time. Um, South Korea in particular has 90 spots for English Teaching Assistantships. Um, South Korea is also uh, the only country that I know of that you can actually renew. You can go and if you get it, if, if you get an ETA award and you really like it, you can potentially renew for another year. Um, so it is a really, really great opportunity. Um, one uh, common denominator among Fulbright applicants here at UF, at least in the time that I've been involved with the program, most of them have been involved with the English Language Institute here at UF. Is, is anybody at all familiar with the ELI here? A couple people? Okay. The English Language Institute is a place where international students, typically graduate students, enroll <coughs> primarily to work on their English language skills before they start their graduate studies here at UF. And the ELI is, common, is, is routinely looking for conversation partners as volunteers. So basically, you go out on a beautiful day like today and sit in the Norman courtyard on a picnic table, and you get paired up with a graduate student, and you simply work on their English skills. And that's a great way for you to get experience in an informal setting to be an ETA. And it's also a great way that if you're studying Arabic to uh, uh, you know, work on your Arabic skills with, with a native speaker. So uh, I encourage you to check that out as a potential volunteer <coughs> opportunity. The ETAs are available um, elementary school all the way up through uh, college level. Some countries will allow you to specify um, you know, what grade level you, uh, what group of students you would like to work with. Others, others will just assign you. I already talked about the side project, emphasizing community engagement, and where the language proficiency isn't necessarily required at the onset, if you do have experience with the language of the host country, the better your chances are going to be for funding. Okay, so all this sounds great. What do I get out of it? In addition to an amazing experience, of course, it covers uh, your transportation, your airfare to and from. Um, you get a monthly stipend, and the monthly stipend varies from country to country. Um, when I went to a Fulbright training uh, sponsored by IE down uh, in Orlando, the, the comment was nobody's ever starved on a Fulbright. So basically, you're living at kind of grad student standards. They're going to provide you with enough funding to have a comfortable you know, place to live, enough food to eat, you know, those sorts of things. They, they, will, they will take care of you. Uh, the, the insurance is taken care of. Some countries will offer support for dependents if you want to take your partner along. Um, research allowance, tuition, language lessons, enhancement activities, 
are all uh, possible grant benefits. So as you can see, as we're going through here, I, I keep saying it depends country to country. Fulbright is one program, but in a way, it's 155 different programs because they have partnerships with all these different countries. And country to country, the, the rules might be, the rules and policies might be a little bit different. Okay, here's the uh, critical language enhancement word that we commented on uh, earlier. Uh, this is um, uh, funding for grantees that, that have had, in some cases, some experience already with the language but really want to uh, increase their level of proficiency. <clears throat> and um, it, the language lessons can go on before, during, and even after the Fulbright grant period. Most of the ones that I've seen for different countries, you, you get there early and you, and you really focus on the language prior to beginning um, your research. And the Critical Language Enhancement Award is something that you apply for in addition uh, to the Fulbright grant program. So you, you do the, the standard application for the research grant and then indicate on there that you're also applying for the Critical Language Enhancement Award. Is that for both the English teaching assistant and the regular research or only for research? That's limited to the research grant. That's a good question to know. Uh, this very busy slide, um, again, as best mentioned, uh, this PowerPoint is already up on the library website, so don't worry if you can't really see this. Um, some uh, languages to apply for the for the language enhancement award requires some prior experience. Arabic, for example, they want you to have a year of college level Arabic uh, before um, uh, you, you apply for the Arabic uh, enhancement award. Other languages uh, like Farsi, something that would be relatively difficult to access in the U.S. There's no minimum language requirement uh, for for certain languages. Okay. All right, so this talks about the uh, application components of the Fulbright grant. Um, first of all, the basic personal data. That's, that's what you would expect. Scholarships you receive, extracurricular activities, student organizations you participate in, affiliations of professional organizations, those sorts of things. Then uh, the, the real kind of meat of the, uh, of, of the proposal is um, your statement of purpose. Uh, essay and your personal statement. And as you can see for the research um, proposal, uh, it's two pages. And initially you think two pages, no problem, knock that out in the afternoon. But actually to sum up 12 months of research activity is a very, very challenging thing to do in two pages. So it's something that really requires a lot of careful thought. Every paragraph needs to count, every sentence really needs to count. So it's something that you need to get started on and then, and, and then continually uh, revise and get a lot of feedback on. But that's, that's what Dr. Siamin and I are for. We can help you uh, uh, refine those proposals and get them the best that they can be. As well as your, your dissertation advisors, your thesis advisors out there, they're also good people um, to run this by. So the statement of, pur uh, statement of purpose uh, for the research uh, proposals is two pages. For the English teaching assistantship, it's just one page for the statement of purpose. And then all of them require a personal statement. So the, personal, the, the research proposal is this is what I intend to do. This is how I'm going to do it. This is a basic timeline of, of, of how I'm going to uh, uh, implement this proposal. And the personal statement is why am I the best qualified person to uh, to fulfill this grant, you know, what are my educational qualifications, what are my personal qualifications, you know, why am I the person, uh, best person for this job. The language report or language evaluation, uh, as it's referred to, if you apply to a country, I mentioned Mexico before, which expects a, a essentially fluency in Spanish, you're going to have to have a language evaluation, and that's done by contacting a faculty member here at UF that teaches Spanish, and they'll have a brief conversation with you, and they will complete a language evaluation form. And essentially, it's just their, in their professional professional opinion, what your level um, of uh, proficiency is with that particular language. Um, not all countries will require a language report. You need three letters of reference. Um, ideally, these are 
all from faculty members. They don't necessarily have to be all from faculty members. If you did a internship or um, you know some other activity where your your referee can speak to your work ethic, your ability to work independently, you know those sorts of things, that's perfectly fine. But I would say really at least two of them <coughs> you know need to be from faculty members. Um, like many uh, scholarship applications these days, what you'll do, it's a, it's a completely online application and you input the email addresses of your, of your recommenders into the, uh, the Embark system, that's the, that's the online system, and then it will email your, your recommenders and explain to them how to upload their letters of recommendation. There's the campus committee evaluation and that's something that I will upload after you have your campus interview. And uh, then your letters of affiliation. Letters of affiliation are essentially an endorsement from someone in the coast country saying, yeah, I know John, I understand what his proposal is and I support it and I'm gonna give him support in the following ways. The letter of affiliation can be from a university in the host country, it can be from an NGO, um, it could be from <clears throat> some other sort of institutional organization within the host country that basically talks about how they're going to support you while you're doing your Fulbright grant. It's not necessarily required for every country. Some countries will absolutely require uh, that you have a letter of affiliation. It's been my experience that the letter of affiliation is typically the most difficult thing uh, to secure <coughs> with the Fulbright grant. So that's something that, that you really need to start working on early uh, because sometimes it can take quite a while to uh, develop those relationships. And if any of you are studying abroad or you're doing a preliminary uh, research visit for your dissertation, that's when you start needing to make, be making those contacts <coughs> in, in the hopes of getting a good letter of affiliation. Okay. Uh, supplementary materials. Is anybody planning on doing a creative uh, fine arts? Yes. Okay. Cool. Let's sit up front. Um, for fine arts, uh, a, a CD with, with images, uh, photographs of, of your work, that sort of thing. There's more information available um, on the site about the specifics of, of the format of those those sorts of things. Yeah. Before you go on. Yeah. Who facilitates the language report? Um, evaluation. How does that? How does the student go about getting one of those? Um, Do they contact you? No, uh, they, they'll contact a, a, a faculty member directly, and particularly if they're undergraduates or, or have studied the language here, then I just recommend that they contact a former uh, professor. If it's a graduate student and you don't and you did your language study uh, as an undergraduate at another institution. I can certainly help kind of point you in directions. Um, but it, it, it could even be a, a former instructor at another institution. I've had students do the uh, language evaluations over the phone uh, with the instructor, and the instructor will sign off on it. So, yeah. But we're, we're definitely here to help with that if you, if you run into any trouble. <coughs> OK. I have a question about Sure, this. yes. For the letters of recommendation, mm -hmm. would it be better to have three letters from three faculty members you've done research with, or have two letters of that, and then one uh, a person you were involved with internationally, like when you studied abroad, and then like worked with them in the study abroad program at the university you were at? Would it be better to have that, or just stick to three faculty members that have been involved with your research? Well, good question. Um, the, the person, in, in the that you work with internationally, is this in the, the host country that you intend to apply to, or no? This no. is like when some, like so, like when I studied abroad when I was an undergrad, then I was in like a study abroad ambassador for the university, and then did various things in that. And I didn't know if it'd be good to have that advisor mm -hmm. as opposed to one of the three faculty members that you've done research. With. Like getting that international aspect of like what you've done. Well, I mean, I, I think I think it, it, there there is a lot of value that for some people that can write about you know, how you adapt to a different culture, how you you know how you were able to work all abroad, you know those sorts of things. I think really what it comes down to is, is who can write the best letter for you. You know, who it is naturally, at least two of those need to be from faculty members that can really talk about your academic preparation.
administration, you know, talk about, I assume you're you talking about doing the research grant? Yeah. Um, you know, talk about, you know, the preparation for your dissertation, you know, those, those sorts of things. But, you know, somebody that has experience working with you internationally might provide a very valuable letter as well. So, that's probably something we should sit down and talk individually about. Okay. Sorry, I just have one more question sure. on the language report. Um, what if it's your like, for example, if it's Spanish, your Spanish teacher, or somebody you've been working with? Or does it have to specifically be a faculty member? It needs to be a faculty member. Okay. Yeah, it needs to be a faculty member. If you have a language certification from a host country, is that accepted? Uh, like, like the TEF, like TEF for, like, I'm looking French. Yeah. There's various. Mm -hmm. The, 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 there's there's one there's one in Germany too. The name of it's escaping me right at the moment. Um, they no, you, you need an evaluation from from a faculty. And as I said, if, if that's it, it's it's really not a uh, it, it's really not a big uh, it, it's a it's a relatively brief conversation. Many of the uh, faculty here at UF are, are accustomed to doing these things and. Um, we can help get that set up. Okay. Um, how to apply. Okay, uh, last year uh, was the first year that uh, Fulbright moved to a completely online format, which is good news for you guys. Uh, it used to be that everything had to be done in hard copy and electronic copy. It's all online now. Um, the references and language report, again, you give your referees instructions and they upload it. Uh, the letters of affiliation are scanned, and you upload them. Your transcripts are scanned, and you upload them as well. What happens with the transcripts is, if you get recommended, then they're going to contact you and ask you to submit official transcripts. But an unofficial transcript, a scanned, unofficial, a scanned official transcript is, is perfectly fine for, for the initial uh, part of the application process. Um, you all are currently enrolled or will be currently enrolled, so you have to go through uh, the campus uh, review process. And let me just point out that the campus, as I said before, the campus review process is intended to be supportive in nature. We don't eliminate anybody. Everybody that applies gets sent on um, to the Institute of National Education. Okay, um, so, uh, Already covered this pretty well, I think. Um, the letters of affiliation, again, are just essentially an endorsement. It can be from a university, a laboratory, an archive, a community organization, NGO, etc. cetera. Um, needs to be on letterhead, signed by, by the person writing the, the letter of affiliation. Um, English teaching assistantships do not need a letter of affiliation. It's only for the research. Okay, um, so this is some contact information from the folks at the Institute for International Education. As you can see, they've divided up different regions of the world. Um, I would encourage you that if you have any initial questions to contact myself or Dr. Sandine. Um, if it's a real specific question um, about the host country, we may refer you on to the good people at, at IIE. Um, I have been incredibly impressed with how quickly these people respond. Anytime I send them a question, I, I a lot of times we'll get a response back the same day. But um, although I would start with us, you shouldn't hesitate to contact these folks. I find them to be very, very helpful. And then uh, my uh, contact information, as well as Dr. Sandine's, um, happy to set up appointments with you. Uh, if you are going to be studying, uh, if you're going to be abroad uh, during the competition cycle um, next year, uh, we had uh, Skype interviews in uh, Botswana and the Netherlands this time, so we can, we can accommodate that. Uh, if needed, my Skype name is Fulbright at UF. Okay, so uh, Institute for International Education has embraced social media and all those fun things. So if you're into tweeting and podcasts and all of the above, you can you can check that out. Um, the uh, the YouTube channel they have basically has alumni testimonials, basically talking about what their experience was and and, and how it worked. The uh, the student applicant blog 
I'm not sure how the applicants have time to write these blogs with everything else that they're doing, but they are pretty helpful. Um, kind of gives tips and, 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 and talks about uh, what the process has been like for them. The webinars, same sort of thing. And with the email address list that's going around today, uh, Best is going to give me a copy of that, and I can send out reminders from time to time when, when Fulbright has their webinars. No charge to participate in it, but you do have to register for them. But I, I do find them to be helpful. Okay, here's a, a shameless plug for International Education Week. Uh, for those of you that maybe are looking uh, to, to uh, develop affiliations, there's going to be a number of non-governmental organizations and uh, private voluntary organizations uh, tomorrow at the Rights Union. Uh, you can see um, uh, it's, it's going to be a day-long event. Uh, the web address is there and there's, a, there's an agenda uh, available, but um, great opportunity uh, tomorrow uh, to explore some activities of NGOs, see what countries they're involved in. Uh, it might be a good, easy first step to uh, possibly developing some affiliations. So, I encourage you to check that out. I think that I heard that over 15 NGOs are going to be there. Um, so, uh, I think that is going to be really interesting. Okay. So, with that, I've been talking a lot. I'd be very happy to entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry to write my question before, but on the graph of the Critical Language Enhancement Award pages. One of them says that it is not eligible for the ETA award, which suggests to me that the others are. Like it says for uh, Indonesia, ETA not eligible for CLEA, which makes me think that maybe, and it says part of college level language study, that sees ETA. So okay. what does that mean that there would be? Well, uh, typically, typically those language enhancement awards are affiliated with the research grants. As I mentioned, there's differences from country to country. Um, so it's, it's possible, just not that common. I suppose it is possible, yes. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. But I think that's the kind of thing if you contact the IID person there and tell them specifically what you're interested in, they can give you a yes or no right away. Okay. There's a list of languages as well that's issued by the State Department that qualifies for CLEA. Mm -hmm. So you should probably, I don't know, I'm going to say contact the CLEA administrator to find out what languages are employed. Yes. You'll be graduating in May 2011. Um, right. You will apply as an at-large <coughs> candidate, which there's really no disadvantage to applying <coughs> as an at-large candidate. You won't go through the campus interview process. Okay. I'd mean, be happy to you know, take a look at the grant proposal. You're welcome to uh, review some of the grants um, that are available. More will be coming on the institutional repository site. Uh, we had uh, permission from two winners last year, one in physics, one in art history. Um, but we have a number of hard copy examples of proposals that are in the honors office, which is on the third floor of the infirmary building, and you're welcome to come in and take a look at those. It, it's really helpful, as Bess mentioned earlier, um, to look at uh, examples. Uh, it kind of gives you a feel for what these grants uh, look like and flow. Uh, of the grants uh, of the writing, so please come in and check this out. Yes? Um, this is related, but I'm graduating with my MA in December 2011. Mm -hmm. That would be after the application process started, so would I, could I apply for UF or would I have to apply? Yeah, you'll, you'll still, you're, you will okay. still be enrolled. Okay. The deadline will be October okay. 2011, so you're, you'll, you'll go through the regular campus process. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go back to the site and show the number of awards per country or there was that yeah. question ahead of time? Okay, sure. I think that might be really interesting. Okay. This is, um, this is our university page um, on the Fulbright uh, site. And um, 
it was a good thing I did this presentation. It was a little bit of a kick in the pants to get me to update the page. So I have updated it. It should be updated tomorrow. And you can see that we can still have uh, this year's um, uh, uh, application information on there. Um, but uh, you can see here um, the different uh, winners from the last three years uh, from UF. Um, if you click on any of these, it will give you just basically a summary of the, the, the title of their proposal, their field of study. And as you're looking at these, you can go uh, to the host country and it will um, basically give you, you know, the information uh, for Malawi. Now, the, under the country summaries tab over here, uh, you can look at different regions. Does anybody, anybody like to shout out a host country they're interested in applying to? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Okay. All right. So, let's see here. Bangladesh. All right. So, uh, it'll tell you. I'm a bit of an old-fashioned person, and I like to pull up my, my, my paper book, and I can easily get to it, but it is on here. Let's see. Um, let's see. Fumbling around uh, the website, um, you guys are good enough to put your uh, email addresses on there. I can, I can, I can send you the link that will give you, will give you the summaries. But those, those are, it is out there and available. Again, I have this paper. Other questions? Yes. Are the ETAs the people who apply for them? Are they usually like a teaching major, or do other majors apply, or? Not necessarily. I mean, you don't have to be. Uh, you don't have to be an education major. You don't have to um, uh, have a minor in teaching English uh, as a foreign language. Um, those things certainly help. Um, but uh, again, students at UF have been very successful. They've simply had some volunteer experience. It, it is helpful if you've had tutoring experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be in teaching English that any kind of teaching, tutoring experience is going to be very helpful. For the ATAs, it seems like there is, in the application, less space for you to kind of explain what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably you're just teaching, so that's a lot of what you're doing. But what kinds of, I mean, is, is your extra community project something that they're really looking at when they're choosing people? Because it seems like most of the application of that is just numbers. I've taught. I have this much language experience. Uh, give me money to do what I was going to do anyway. If you're going to teach me, so anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're right. The the uh, the research proposal. I mean, naturally, you have to explain, you know, what your intended project is going to be. The English teaching assistantship. Well, it's obvious you're going you're going to teach English. So in that project proposal, you're really talking more um, about, you know, again, your you know, what do you hope to get out of this? You know, how is this how is this going to fit in? Um, you know, to your career path. Um, again, explaining you know, you know why you're you know best qualified uh, to do this. We have we've been fortunate in the past four years. We've had at least one English teaching assistantship winner at UF, and we have although we we're not going to have any immediately in the institutional repository. I do have examples of the back of the honors uh, program office, so that would be good for you to come in and take a look. 
other question is. so already, please make sure that you sign um, the, uh, the sign-in sheet. Um, I would be very happy uh, to speak with you uh, about your grant proposals, and uh, I thank you for your interest in Fulbright, and I hope to